we'll bring you back to last Thursday when we were talking about reactions of alkenes. Uh, we went through quite a few new things with alkenes. Just to remind you, um, when we think about most of the general reactions, they involve formations of carbocation intermediates. So these carbocation intermediates and the structure and stability of them matter a lot for how a reaction proceeds because it helps control the directions of things that add. Um, so just to remind you, the more substituted a carbon with a plus charge on it is, the more stable it is, the lower in energy it is. So that impacts reaction pathways. So if you have unsymmetric double bonds where the substitution on either end is different, the different degree of substitution, the carbocation on either end would be of different stabilities. And so the reactions will proceed in the first step to form intermediates, which are lower in energy, because overall that creates a lower energy pathway. And we see that, for instance, in the selectivity in adding uh, HCl or HBr to a double bond. So the hydrogen adds to the carbon with the most hydrogens, and the halogen adds to the carbon with the least number of hydrogens, or the most substituents. Uh, and we restated that general empirical rule to take into account the understanding of this, uh, that when you have alkenes that are reacting with an electrophile, it'll occur, uh, protonation will occur to form a more stable carbocation intermediate. And then whatever is negatively charged adds to the uh, to where that carbocation is. And that's not just for adding protons. So remember we talked about a, a number of reactions which, I, which were summarized here. Uh, we didn't go through all of these, uh, but certainly we first talked about the addition of HX to a double bond where we added a hydrogen plus followed by a halogen minus. And there's some certain selectivity, what we refer to as Markovnikov selectivity in those reactions, which uh, which is described or explained by the carbocation intermediates. We talked about the addition of water, uh, generally with a hydrogen or a Bronsted acid catalyst, so an H plus adds first, followed by water second, and then of course because that generates an unstable uh, cation species, the proton comes back off to generate a catalyst. But that is exactly the same as adding HX in terms of all the features of the reaction and the positions where those groups add. Because if you think about it, we're adding some kind of uh, plus charge species first, in this case a proton, followed by the equivalent of an OH minus. Uh, and it would again occur through selectivity as described by Markovnikov. We talked about adding halogens. So in this case, like Br2 or, or Iodine, I2, something like that. Bromine adds to, to put one of those as a plus and one of those as a minus. And do you remember what was different about adding bromine? Compared to HX? <laughs> yeah, it makes the pyramid kind of thing. Actually, a triangle. Uh, a, a cyclic ring. So if it's, if it's HX, it, like in this pathway, this is what would be formed if, we, if A was proton. Okay. Uh, if A is a halogen, like bromine, then it forms this kind of bridging species that I've shown on the bottom. That has implications, not necessarily in adding to propene, but where stereochemistry is present in the products. Right? The, the two bromines or two iodines or whatever we're adding will add on opposite sides of, say, a double bond that's in a ring. So you can get cis or trans isomers, it'll be selective for the trans one. Okay, so those are the main three main uh, reactions of electrophilic addition here that's uh, described in your textbook. We talked about hydrogenation, adding hydrogen across, uh, which is a slightly different mechanism involving a catalyst, which is helping to break both the hydrogen bonds and deliver them to the alkene. Um, also in a selective way. So just to remind you that uh, this reaction occurs to put these two hydrogens on the same side. Again, if you're just reacting with ethane, you don't see any stereochemistry. But if you, again, do it on a case where you are generating the possibilities of cis and trans isomers, 
the hydrogens will add in what way? Cis or trans? If the hydrogens are being added to the double bond from the same side, and you have a, 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 an alkene, say, which is in a ring, which is fixed, those hydrogens would add cis to each other. Okay? So they're on the same side, if it matters, in the particular example uh, that you're looking at. Okay, uh, if you're still confused, I think I gave the example of something like cyclopentene, where we had, say, dimethyl cyclopentene. If you do the hydrogenation, you make cyclopentene, cyclopentane, where uh, the, oops, undo. Ah, I'm not writing very well. Okay, where the two hydrogens are adding on the same side, which puts the two methyl groups on the other side. So if I add the hydrogens on the bottom, my poorly drawn hydrogens here, uh, they're adding on the same side, you would, so you would get the cis product. Okay. So bromine adds trans, hydrogenation adds cis. Okay, you can do that selectively. The other thing we talked about was oxidation reactions. And so if you remember, we were able to uh, generate these molecules uh, with a functional group epoxides with a three-membered ring containing oxygen, not just carbons. And that reaction occurs by directly inserting an oxygen from a, a per, shoot, from a per acetic acid or a peroxy acid functional group. So that reagent takes one of those reactive oxygens where you have an oxygen-oxygen bond and puts it in across a double bond in one step. So you can form these three-membered ring compounds. And those are very useful for making other things, particularly uh, molecules which have two alcohol groups next to each other. So here for, oh, I didn't turn that on again. So here, for example, a diol, what we refer to as a diol, um, obviously two alcohols, so two alcohol functional groups can be prepared from an epoxide by opening up that three-membered ring with uh, water. So similar to adding H plus to a double bond, you can add H plus to an oxygen lone pair. Okay, and that then makes those bonds even more reactive because now that oxygen has a plus charge form of charge. So the bonds to those oxygens are weaker, and that makes it uh, a better uh, group to leave. So the water that's coming in will react from the bottom side, because the top is blocked in the example I showed, to push those electrons back to oxygen. And then after that proton comes off, you get the final product. And it's, again, very selective to do trans to form the trans diol products when you have something like a ring like this. Okay, remember all that? Refresh your memory. Well, we were just uh, ending the class when I, I talked about this other oxidation reagent called potassium permanganate, KMNO4. It's a very strong oxidant, and, and if you're interested in the details of the reaction, I can explain a little bit more if it helps you out. It's not that I would expect you to remember it. Uh, but that adds two alcohol groups on the same side. So we actually have uh, synthetic tools in our hands to be able to generate the functionality we want with the stereochemistry that we desire for whatever we wanted to do with these things. We have the control to do that. And that's the, the great thing about um, having different reagents to make the similar kinds of functional groups. They might have different selectivities. So. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the structure of permanganate, MnO4. MnO4 minus has a structure which looks like this. It has a lot of bonds to it because the transition metals can be in higher oxidation states. So overall, it's a, it's a structure which looks something like that with a minus charge overall, and then there's a potassium 
cation associated with that permanganate. Okay, that's KMnO4. And what happens is because the manganese is really highly oxidized already, it, it has the ability to oxidize other groups, in particular double bonds. So when you have cyclohexene, what happens is, uh, I can draw the electrons like this. And an intermediate, an intermediate actually looks like something like this. Sorry, I'm drawing on top of the structures. That's why we get the cis uh, reaction, because it's putting both of those oxygens at the same time across the double bond. So if you're interested in those mechanistic details, permanganate allows us to do that because it's putting two oxygens at once, as opposed to making an epoxide first and then adding the second one from the other side. Uh, the conditions, you'll notice the other conditions there, uh, aqueous sodium hydroxide base. Essentially what that does is break apart this permanganate and put those hydrogens on. So that, that <laughs> cyclic manganese structure isn't stable under basic conditions, and that's why we get the final product. If we allow uh, that intermediate to sit around longer and under different kinds of conditions, what happens is even the hydrogens that are adjacent come off and break the, and reduce the manganese further oxidizing the carbon more. Okay, so if we do this longer, uh, uh, permanganate is a pretty strong oxidizing agent and what it does overall, and this is what you really would need to remember, overall it breaks the double bond completely in half and puts double bonded oxygens on both sides. Okay. Uh, and that's if we do this under acidic conditions. So uh, it, it makes the oxidation actually even more uh, stronger, enough to break even the carbon-carbon single bond that's left, the sigma bond. Now, um, I should point out, I've shown you an example with a cyclic structure. I should ask you then, what is the product? Uh, let me just uh, erase this. What is the product if I were to say take uh, this molecule? And react it with potassium permanganate uh, and sodium hydroxide conditions. What do you think would happen? Well, you'd add an OH group on either end of the double bond. So what we would get would be, how many carbons do I have? Okay. We'd add an OH group there and an OH group there. A diol, right? Now because there's a single bond rotation, there's no way to see that that actually added at the same time. There's no stereochemistry with that. Uh, because there's fast rotation about that. We see that when it's in a ring and stuck. Uh, so that's why I didn't show any, because there is none. Um, so that stops there, but what if I use, instead of sodium hydroxide, I use the acidic conditions? You get double bond oxygens, right. In this case, it's not a ring that I start with. It's a, the, it's a double bond that's just in a chain. So it actually breaks apart the molecule and you get two molecules, okay? In the case, in the example I showed here, they just happen to be tethered together because it was originally a ring. But that carbon-carbon bond broke. If it's not attached on this side, then you would get two different molecules, right? So here, what happens is the double bond breaks in half completely, and you get a double bond of oxygen on both sides. So on this side, you get uh, that product plus, uh, let's see how many carbons, one, two, three, four on the other side. So those are the two products you would get from 
potassium permanganate under acidic conditions. Okay, this actually demonstrates that uh, when we have a reagent, it can do different things depending on other conditions in the reaction. If the reaction's basic, it might take one path. If it's acidic, it takes another. Um, this is very common, and that's why uh, ultimately it, it helps, I think, to understand a little more the, the mechanistic details. So that's oxidation using permanganate. There's some more synthetic tools we have to be able to take a double bond and convert it into other functional groups. Yes, question? Yeah, when you use the sodium hydroxide, how did you know where to place the Okay, where did I know to place the hydroxide groups? Good question. When I use sodium hydroxide. Uh, oh, I erased everything. Let me just draw that again. So where the double bond is, so this was the molecule, right? Where the double bond is, um, you're breaking the pi bond that's right here. And so uh, an OH group has to go on either end of where the double bond originally was. Uh, so it's those carbons of the double bond that were originally sp2 get the alcohol and become SP3. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. Um, alkenes. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of things we can do with an alkene as a functional group to make that into other functional groups to do things with or to uh, adorn molecules with various things. Uh, another really important uh, impact of alkenes and the chemistry of alkenes actually impacts all of you every day is they are feedstocks for making polymers okay in plastics and there are many many kinds of different polymers um, and actually there are many different kinds of chemical reactions uh, that can be used to make polymers uh, polyesters uh, polyamides nylons those are different kinds of polymers but a lot of the polymers and plastics we used today come from the polymerization of alkenes. Okay, one of the main ways in which alkenes are, are polymerized together are using free radical reactions, not polar reactions. And I'm going to describe a little bit about free radical reactions in a minute. Um, but what I've shown here are some examples of, of polymers. And the polymers are essentially very long chains of uh, <coughs> carbon backbones. Um, that are, and I, you can see I've drawn sort of a long chain and then put these, put these brackets on the end. So what that means is this is probably repeating many times for very long chains. They could be hundreds of carbons or, you know, in principle thousands of carbons long. And this molecule that I've represented by this particular segment is just CH2 groups all in a long chain. And this is a polymer we call polyethylene. You know, PET, polyethylene. Um, polyethylene is used all over the place. What I've shown above are, is kind of a representation of the alkenes they came from. So notice, uh, if polyethylene is made from ethylene or ethene, a two carbon unit with a double bond. I've drawn dashed bonds here to show how the carbons carbons link up when we do the polymerization. So if you think about the double bond, notice what happens when we go from ethene to polyethylene. We start with pi bonds, and in the, in the polymer we don't have any more pi bonds. The pi bond has reacted to form the new carbon-carbon bonds between the monomer units or the ethylene units. Okay, so the electrons basically flowed. Well, there's one electron process. I'll show you how this works in a minute. Um, but essentially, those double bonds are replaced now for new single bonds. Okay? This can be done with all kinds of substituted alkenes. Polyethylene is the simplest one. Uh, if you have uh, a benzene ring attached to, to the alkene group, uh, it's abbreviated PH for phenyl. It's a benzene ring. Uh, that's polystyrene. That's what we refer to as polystyrene. So notice you have the double bonds here. All the alkene carbons, the two carbons from the alkenes, have joined up into this chain. And then the groups that are hanging off are just decorating that chain. 
all the way along the way, every two carbons, or every two carbon unit. So notice the structure. And so one thing you should be able to do is recognize if you're given um, if you're given a polymer structure uh, chain or segment, you should be able to say what starting alkene created that. And if you look here, if we just take that segment, that's the repeating segment, right? Those are the repeating segments, and the chain that's attached must have come from double bonds. So they came from these alkenes to start with. Okay, so you recognize how those units are incorporated then into the chain. If you're given a chain, would you be able to tell me which alkene created that through a polymerization reaction? That's what you have to try to look for in some of these. Polystyrene. Anyone knows what polystyrene is used for? Styrofoam. Styrofoam cups. That's all polystyrene. It can be processed in many different uh, ways to make the foam that you see for a styrofoam cup. is just the polymer has been processed in a particular way. PVC, polyvinyl chloride. PVC for PVC pipes, right? Polyvinyl chloride. So vinyl chloride is a common name for an alkene. So what do you think the alkene is that made the backbone structure for polyvinyl chloride? Can you identify what the repeating unit is in that chain? Repeating unit. So again, take a look at the simplest alkene uh, polymer, polyethylene. Every two carbon unit was two carbons with a double bond. Yeah, chloro chloroethylene or chloroethane, or ethene. So if you look at this, let's say, okay, let's just take cut here, 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 here. Those are every two carbons I've cut. So the pieces, then, you just have a double bond. So if I just think about this group here, two carbons with a chlorine, the unit, the monomer, we call it the monomer that makes the polymer, is, would be this. Okay, just a two carbon alkene with a chlorine on it. You get a whole bunch of those in a row, and are chain, lined up uh, through a polymerization reaction and you form the carbon backbone from this double bond. Okay, does that help you see that a little bit? Okay, good. Okay, there are a number of ways in which we can make this reaction happen. Uh, but what we need to do, and what's done most commonly, is a free radical reaction because alkenes are quite susceptible to the additions of free radicals to break the pi bond. And those free radicals that are generated from the initial step react very nicely with another double bond to generate another free radical. It makes another double bond. So it's a chain reaction. And when we think about trying to make long chains from a small unit, you want a reaction which is very efficient to do a chain reaction. Um, so what we need to do to think about this is to figure out a way to generate the initial radical to start the chain reaction process. Uh, so in a free radical polymerization, it usually starts with some step, with a, a step which we refer to as an initiation step. So we need to find some way to generate reactive free radical species where we have unpaired electrons. And things like benzoyl peroxide, this is a very good initiator for free radical reactions. Um, notice the structure of benzoyl peroxide. <laughs> it has within it an oxygen-oxygen bond. That's a peroxide bond. Hydrogen peroxide, H-O-O-H, -O -O -H is the simplest peroxide. The oxygen-oxygen bond is really weak. It's easy to break the bond homolytically, either by heating it, typically benzoyl peroxide is uh, cleaved by heating it, or by uh, photochemical reaction. So it absorbs a energy from light and breaks it apart. So this 
is a, a good way to generate free radical species to start other reactions off. So if you take a look at this equation, I haven't balanced this equation. Essentially what happens is if you, if you heat this benzoyl peroxide up, the bond between the oxygens break homolytically. It's supposed to be my half arrowhead curved arrows. One electron from the bond goes to each of the oxygens. And you end up then with, from each molecule of benzoyl peroxide, two molecules of the benzoyl radical. Okay. So many, many free radical reactions, whether it's polymerization or other things, have this kind of three-step, uh, three parts to it. There's initiation to take something where you have no radicals to begin with and generate reactive free radicals. That's referred to as initiation. And that's what's happened here. Benzoyl peroxide has no unpaired electrons. We heat it up, we break it apart, we have reactive free radicals. Okay? If you do that, generate this in the presence of a lot of alkenes, those free radicals will start reacting with the alkene. So this starts our chain propagation. So if you think about uh, propene, polypropylene is another uh, polymer, which starts from propene. So the two carbons that are reacting to form the polymer chain are the two carbons of the original double bond, and then this group is just hanging off. So our, our polymer, in the end, will have methyl groups hanging off on, every of the, on all the repeating units. So what happens is when this benzoyl radical comes close to the double bond, it wants to form a bond with the carbon, but it only needs one electron, right? Only needs one electron. So what happens is that the pi bond breaks homolytically. So we have one electron from the pi bond go to form a new sigma bond with the oxygen. And then the other electron in here goes on to the carbons. And what we get then, and I've abbreviated benzoyl as BZO, just for uh, simplicity, you get the benzoyl radical added to the double bond carbon. We formed a new single bond, and what's left is a carbon over here that has a free radical on it, as one electron, unpaired. Okay. Now that's still a reactive species. One uh, aspect that characterizes in any free radical reactions a chain propagation uh, step in a mechanism is something that's a radical reacting with something that's not a radical to generate a new product that still has some radical reactivity. There's still a radical. So notice there's, there's a free radical species on the left side of the equation and still a free radical species on the right side of the equation. Then that allows more reactions to take place, right? chain propagation. So that's the, that's the first step. After we've initiated benzoyl radical, then that adds to a double bond, generates now a carbon radical, and that's where we start now linking up carbons. So that carbon radical will bump into another alkene and do the same reaction the benzoyl radical did. It'll form a new single bond from the alkene uh, to the radical in the exact same way. This radical is one half of the new covalent bond, and then one of the electrons from the pi bond is the other half of the new covalent bond, and then the other radical from the pi bond goes on to the carbon on the other end of the double bond. Okay. So that, in that step, we have, I'm going to highlight this. This is the new bond that we've just created. The one I'm highlighting here in red. That's the new bond that was created when the carbon radical met the alkene. And notice, it still leaves behind in the product a free radical. Okay. And this is also a chain propagation step because we still have a reactive species. And then that just keeps going and going. I don't remember if I have it on there. 
perspective. So this product keeps going. So uh, the product of that will react with another alkene, okay, and react again to add another carbon, another car two carbon group, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in, in uh, principle, that could go on forever, right? As long as you have alkenes around for it to react with. Question? Yeah, um, how do you know where the new bond is? Well, the new bond, so you notice uh, in this case, uh, the new bond always has to go from the carbon that the radical's on to one of the ends of the double bond. Okay? And I've drawn it in a very specific way. So I've joined this carbon to that carbon. Okay, and then put the radical on the other part. Why do you think I did that? So each end of the double bond. Yeah, each end of the double bond. Uh, but it does react selectively. Um, free radicals on carbons have the same stability as carbocations. So it'll react, uh, the new bond will form from the original radical to the less substituted carbon, leaving the radical on the more substituted so it's a similar kind of Markovnikov selectivity. Uh, but it's always on the ends of the double bond. So the rad carbon with the radical will react to the end of a double bond to make the new carbon-carbon bond between them. And then the, then, so this, so uh, the bond formed to this carbon and then the free radicals left on the other carbon of the double bond. Okay, so that keeps going and going and going. As I said, uh, theoretically it can go forever. But um, there's always practical limits, right? We run out of alkene. We use it all up. Then we have to think about what happens then. Uh, there are other ways that can stop this chain reaction. So what is the key aspect of a chain propagation step? You have free radical on the left side, and then you do a reaction and you still have reactive free radicals on the right side. So can you think of any way in which any of these things present in this mixture now as you start building things up, you have lots of things in, in the mixture. Uh, what could stop the reaction, stop it from proceeding? No, not positively charged, but doing some kind of reaction where the products no longer have a reactive free radical. That's a dead end, or a termination step, we refer to it. Okay, so there's a number of things that can happen. Uh, I just represented a couple of uh, things here, but as you start doing this reaction pot, you have uh, carbon radicals. You have two radicals that bump into each other. Instead of a radical reacting with a pi bond, we have two, two radicals bumped together and form a new bond between them. So I've just shown this example where we have this radical which forms to that radical and then makes a new bond between those carbons just by combining the two radicals together. That made, let me see if I get this straight, that made this new bond on the right side. And the result when two radicals combine is that you generate no more radicals. So this is what we would refer to as a termination step. Uh, two radicals combine to form a stable molecule where there are no more free radical species and the chain reaction stops because it doesn't have a productive pathway. Okay? So without a productive pathway, nothing else can happen. So uh, that's one way in which chain reactions could stop. Because if you think about it, you only need one molecule, in theory, of benzoyl peroxide to start the reaction and let it go forever. But in reality, radicals bump into more than just alkenes, they bump into other radicals, so you tend to need to keep reinitiating things. Uh, so that's one example of a termination step. Can you think of other things that are in this reaction mixture? Oops, what did I do? Went too far. Can you think of other things in this reaction mixture which might bump into each other? Which would be, we would refer to as a termination step. Uh, 
what other radicals do we have? We have the carbon radicals from either the initial or some, some amount of chain build up already, and you have a radical on the end. So two carbon radicals. What if this carbon radical bumped into a benzoyl radical? That could happen. So these could combine, and so you would end up with the benzoyl stopping, oops, stopping the reaction. That could happen. Another way which we could terminate radicals that we've generated, with, well, two benzoyl radicals could come together. So the reverse of the very initial step, which was the breaking of the benzoyl peroxide. All of those things are steps which tend to limit the chain, how far the chains progress in this, in this kind of process. So overall, overall, we essentially have three steps in a free radical polymerization reaction. Some kind of initiation step where we generate free radical species where we had none before. Okay, benzoyl peroxide to form benzoyl radicals. Then propagation steps where radical species add to the double bond, it generates a new radical on a carbon. That carbon reacts with another double bond to generate a new carbon-carbon bond and more radicals, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then eventually there's enough radical species around that the concentration is high, they start bumping into each other and halting those chains. Okay? So People who do polymer chemistry and engineers really think in detail about all the things that limit those chains and how to control it. Concentration. If they have a large concentration of alkene, uh, but the number of free radicals is more dilute, they get longer chain processes happening before they start terminating. Um, different reactivities of things. So they can really kind of manipulate things uh, by engineering the reactions to do different sizes of polymers. And different sizes, lengths of polymers, actually have different properties in the plastics. So there's a whole field of chemistry on, uh, and chemical engineering on how to make polymers, which is kind of fascinating. And it could take a whole year to talk about, so I won't do that here. But that's common features of all free radical reactions, uh, generally, where you have chain reactions um, that get propagated by generating reactive species over and over again. Okay, but again, if you can look at a polymer structure, a linear chain, and, and figure out and see what the repeating unit is, and identify what you must have started with, um, that's, that's very useful to be able to do. Okay, another aspect of double bonds that's really important is a, is a concept which is sometimes a little difficult to understand. And this is the idea of double bond spacing throughout a molecule when you have more than one. What we refer to as conjugation. Conjugation. So this happens when we have double bonds which are, uh, are, uh, are along a carbon chain every other carbon. So you have alternating double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. In that case, if you think about the double bonds and single bonds, uh, and then the next double bond, uh, we can see that the p orbitals could all be lined up. So in this case, if we have the four carbon butadiene, right? We have four carbons in a row. We have two double bonds that are alternating: double bond, single bond, double bond. But each carbon, if you just look at the hybridization of the carbon, each carbon has a p orbital on it, right next to each other. Okay? If I were to draw it the way I've drawn these double bonds here and just show what orbitals are overlapping, okay, that one's overlapping for that double bond, and that one's overlapping for that double bond. That's what this line drawing structure would, would uh, try to represent, right? But if you think about four pi bonds in a row, 
If these are overlapping and next to each other, is there any communication between the two pi bonds? Do electrons flow through there? And the answer is yes, actually. That's what we refer to as conjugation. When we have alternating double, single, double, single bonds, uh, all of the pi bonds are in one pi system. They're actually spread out over the whole molecule. So the two electrons here and the two electrons here are not just located there. They're actually spread out because they're next to each other. Okay? Compare that with 1,3-pentadine. Okay, notice if I take those two double bonds and then isolate it, separate them by an sp3 carbon, okay, this double bond is here, and this double bond is here, but there's no pi bond on the carbon between them, and no p orbital. So in that case, those electrons aren't being felt throughout the whole molecule. They're isolated in those particular pi bonds. Is there a question over here? That's what we refer to conjugation. And because uh, the more double bonds that we have conjugated together, uh, the, the ability of uh, the, the localization of those electrons actually spreads out more. Okay. And if you do absorbance of um, electromagnetic radiation, like uh, absorbance of light energy, the longer those conjugation is in a molecule, the lower in energy it takes to excite the molecule. It can absorb energy at a lower energy. So much so that you get to a point where it's no longer out of our visible region, but something like beta carotene, this structure, notice there's all these double bonds are all alternated, single double, single double. That actually absorbs energy in the visible light region, so it's not um, reflecting all the light, so it looks colored to us. So beta carotene has an orange color. So the, the chemistry of color and dyes and everything else is, uh, is very important with the idea of conjugation. Okay, so the more conjugation, <clears throat> the different colors you can get from different lengths of conjugation. So if you can see the molecule like beta carotene, is there any place where a double bond is not conjugated with the other double bonds? Are they all continuous sp2 hybridization? Yes, beta carotene has conjugation throughout the whole double bond system. So from here, okay, that's all conjugated. So all the electrons actually are spread out throughout the whole, that whole carbon system. Well, here's another molecule, lycopene. Lycopene is the, what looks like it's red. Notice the conjugated portion I've highlighted in red here. This is the um, molecule from tomatoes. So that's the conjugated portion. There are some other double bonds in the molecule. Here's one on this end, and here's one on this end. But notice, in between, there are some sp3 hybridized carbons. So there's not continuous p orbitals. Okay. So the part that's absorbing light in the visible region and, and then making the molecule actually look red uh, is this part in the middle here. So it's a different color, it's not orange. Beta carotene is a longer extended conjugation. Lycopene has a shorter conjugation length of the double bonds. Um, and it absorbs slightly different frequencies of light. So we see it a slightly different color. This one happens to be red. Um, what's interesting about this, I have a picture to show you. Uh, an experiment, actually. I used to do this live, but uh, students started choking on fumes and I decided not to do that in these lecture halls anymore. Um, this is a, a graduated cylinder. And what do you think is in the graduated cylinder? Tomato juice. I have tomato juice in the graduated cylinder. I have a vial here that has a slightly brown color. You know, it's 
in there. A reaction we've talked about this through reagents. It's bromine. Actually, it's bromine dissolved in some water. And if you take that bromine water and you add it to the graduated cylinder just on top, carefully, and gently stir that graduated cylinder, we see something like this. What do you think is happening? It's creating different lengths of conjugation, right. So notice now, instead of just red color, which we still have lycopene here on the bottom, you can see red on the bottom, but you see like this, almost a rainbow, where you have purple, blue, green, it's getting a little yellow at the top. Okay? The color changes depending on the concentration of the bromine. This is actually demonstrating of the reaction that we talked about, addition of Br2 to a double bond. So what happens when you add Br2 to a double bond? It adds a bromine on either end, but in the process it breaks the pi bond and makes sp 3 hydrides carbons. So what the bromine is doing is actually reacting at various places along this lycopene chain. The more concentration of bromine is, the more chains, the more uh, those double bonds are broken up and the less conjugation we have. And so we're changing the energy of the light absorbance by varying the chain lengths of the double bond conjugation. It's a nice experiment to demonstrate uh, the effect of conjugation on uh, color. Well, here's another molecule. This is very important in dyes. So uh, if you've ever been in a the organic laboratory, let me take the 341L class, probably not. Um, we do a, we make some dyes. This actually, this molecule on the left is red. And the structure on the right, when you react it with sodium hydroxide and change the pH, uh, you're changing the extent of conjugation of the molecule. So notice uh, when you go from left to right, this part is changing and you're extending out a pi bond out there. And here we have instead of OHO minus, so that negative charge is actually being pushed into the whole system. Okay. Uh, this is the red color from grapes. It's a red-purple color. When you treat that, when you take grape juice and add sodium hydroxide to it, it turns blue. Because we've changed these anthocyanins, which are the color compounds, we've changed the conjugation to a slightly different conjugation. It's absorbing a different wavelength. So that's also a neat experiment. Take grape juice and uh, uh, shake it up with a little bit of base, and you can turn your red grape juice blue. I don't think that's how they made blue ketchup, though. <laughs> I have no idea how they did that. They didn't brominate your ketchup. I hope not. So conjugation. Conjugation is important for color. Uh, but we also need to think a little bit about the impacts of double bonds which are conjugated or not conjugated in chemistry, in reactions. Because when we talk about additions to double bonds, there are a lot of things that can happen. So if we, if we go back and look at this electrophilic addition to dienes, or to an alkene, you add HBr. There are, because in a conjugated system, the double bonds are no longer isolated, you can get different kinds of products where the bromine adds into very different places. And if you were to track the addition of HBr to butadiene, you would see uh, that the hydrogen uh, adds to the N carbon, as you would expect. Um, bromine would then add to the carbocation that was formed, that intermediate, the more substituted carbon. So this would be what you would expect from Markovnikov selectivity, right? HBr, hydrogen on the more substituted carbon, bromine on the less, I'm sorry, hydrogen on the less substituted carbon, bromine on the more substituted carbon. But in fact, there's another product that's formed. 
And that has the hydrogen atom on one end of the butadiene and bromine added all the way on the other end of the four carbon chain. And notice the double bond, which was not between these two middle two carbons, ends up between the middle two carbons. That's because the two double bonds are conjugated and we're not just looking at an isolated double bond. The carbocation that's generated gets spread out, and I'll show you that in a minute. The carbocation gets spread out. Same thing with bromination, or actually addition of any electrophile to a double bond. You can see there are two different products that result, where we're not just reacting across the double bond, but we're reacting across the whole conjugated system, one on each end. And if it's even further conjugated, you can get all different uh, products where those electrophiles would be adding in all different places. Okay. So, what is the effect of conjugation on these reactions? Well, it's important then to think about the structure of that intermediate. So here I've just shown three carbons, but keep in mind what I'm talking about is a, is a potential intermediate that happens when you take butadiene and react it with HBr. Okay. Proton adds to form a carbocation intermediate. Okay, that hydrogen added there. Now notice that carbocation intermediate. Notice the three carbon chain, three carbon unit that contains a double bond and an empty orbital with a plus charge. A three carbon unit with a double bond it has a, a common name which we refer to as an allyl group. Allyl. So that carbocation, we would refer to as an allylic carbocation. So notice, if you, again, think about the structure, the line structure I've drawn here, um, and look at that in terms of the p orbitals on the, hybrid, on the carbons which are sp2 hybridized. We have a double bond adjacent to an empty p orbital. So notice from the last slide, I'm going to back up one and show you. Notice, and I want you to relate that structure here. Notice that the product uh, of addition to the carbocation here, uh, the initial carbocation, would give this product. How do you think the bromine gets on that end? That carbocation has to move out to that position. That's how we get the bromine adding to that. So think about the structure of this allyl carbocation. Uh, in actuality, uh, the electrons that are in that pi bond are spread out. Okay? And the plus charge then is spread out between the two ends. So if, if I can draw this, uh, if, if you want to imagine the electrons moving, so the, pi bond, the electrons in the pi bond here uh, shift over here to make the pi bond now look like this with the plus charge over here. Okay, so an allylic carbocation actually has positive charge character on both ends of the three carbon unit that's conjugated. <coughs> so that's one of the effects of conjugation, that not only are the pi bonds spread out, but also charges, uh, plus charges are spread out. And actually, if you have a lone pair, a lone pair gets spread out as well. Okay, and so you would have, let me just draw this. So you would have this also as a potential position for the negative charge. Free radicals do the same thing. So this free radical is existing in a p orbital. It'll, one of the electrons here will move over and that one will move over there. And so you can have that free radical existing on the other. All of these are allylic systems that are what we refer to as conjugating. 
A negative charge can be conjugated throughout, or a free radical can be conjugated throughout, and in particular with electrophilic addition, the plus charge intermediates has that plus charge delocalized throughout. Okay, so just a couple more terms. Um, this term allyl or allylic we refer to as a three carbon group uh, with a double bond. And so we refer to the various positions on this. So you can see some of the ways in which this terminology is used. So notice the three carbon group with a double bond and the alcohol is attached to the sp3 carbon of that. That's the allylic alcohol or an allylic halide in the case of bromine. Three carbon group. Uh, and we refer to the positions as on the carbon adjacent to that double bond as allylic positions, allylic hydrogens, for example. So the propene, the hydrogens on the methyl group would be allylic adjacent to a double bond. The hydrogens on the double bond, you might hear me refer to this also as vinylic, vinyl. Uh, again, common names that stem from vinyl, polyvinyl, chloride, polyvinyl things. Vinyl comes from that. Vinyl records are a polymer of vinylic groups. So that brings up this concept. So if you think about systems where uh, you have continuous row of p orbitals, more than just one double bond, it could be a double bond in a carbocation, or a double bond in another double bond, uh, those electrons, as we've just talked about, get spread out, and the charges get spread out throughout the whole length of the conjugation. Okay? Uh, and we have a hard time describing that with specific Lewis structures. But the actual structure is hard to represent with a Lewis structure like we've been trying to do. Uh, and that makes it difficult. And that's why we have this concept we, which we refer to as resonance structures or resonance forms. So let's take a close look at the structure of an allylic carbocation. Okay? We just show that if you have a plus charge next to the double bond, uh, that we have a three carbon unit with three continuous p orbitals. And we, we draw it in a line structure with a Lewis representation where we have a pi bond here and an empty orbital there. But if you actually probe the physical characteristics of what allyl carbocation looks like, it's not unsymmetric. It doesn't have plus charge on one side. It's symmetric. If you look at uh, calculating actually the, the molecular orbitals or the shape of it. Notice all three carbons here have the pi system spread out. If you calculate the charge density on any particular atom in there, notice uh, most of the electron density is located on the middle carbon. The two N carbons are darker in color or more, more positively charged, so the plus charge is spread out equally so there's like half of a plus charge here and half of a plus charge there. It's not that the double bond and the electrons are moving back and forth necessarily. It's that the structure is something in between. We represent that with the individual Lewis structures. So if I look at this line drawing, let me clear this for you. If I look at this line drawing, I can draw another structure where I move the electrons over here, leaving the other end of the carbon empty, okay? So I can, I can uh, describe the spreading out of the charge of electrons in this way, by drawing that structure on the right and the other structure on the left of that conjugated system. But neither one of those actually exists. You don't have a full carbocation on one side or the other at any given time. What you have is something which is a basically a combination of those two, something in between. Okay? The real structure is this. But how do you draw bonds and Lewis dot structures for half a plus charge? 
We don't have a way to represent that. So instead, we have to recognize this limitation of our way to describe Lewis structures and represent them by showing these resonance forms. So what, what this is, and notice my arrow in here that I'm showing is not an equilibrium arrow. It's a, it's a resonance arrow. It's one line with a head, an arrowhead on both ends. That's a resonance arrow, not an equilibrium arrow. And it signifies that neither of these structures on the end actually exists. What exists is a combination of something in between there. But we represent it by these extremes with a Lewis-type structure on both ends, showing localized electrons. Does that make sense? It's a difficult concept, and I want you to take some time to absorb this and, and go through the uh, homework problems and uh, think about this a lot. Uh, here's the allylic carbocation that is the intermediate when we add HBr to butadiene. So if you imagine we had added HBr to butadiene, let me draw it here. If we had butadiene and we added HBr and that hydrogen ended up there, what's left is this three carbon conjugated carbocation, which is spread out. The plus charge, again, is spread out. We can't represent that by any one of those structures because the structure actually looks more like something in between. Okay, something in between. It's not one or the other. Those don't exist. I want to reiterate that. When we, when we represent resonance forms, they're extreme views of what actually exists in between them. They don't exist themselves. Okay. Uh, this is um, very common. Uh, we see this in many places. So here's an example of ozone, O3. I've just drawn, I haven't drawn all the electrons for O3, but if you were to fill out the Lewis structure for ozone, where would you put all the electrons in the bonds? So each oxygen comes with six valence electrons. We want everything to have an octet, right? But we need to be able to satisfy the octet on all the oxygens and think about what um, all the charges and where all the bonds are. So uh, I'll just uh, show you how this ozone actually looks when we look at a full Lewis structure of it. So in this case, we can think about it like this. Let's see. I'll put a double bond there, and I'll put in a couple of lone pairs on that oxygen. That oxygen on the left now has an octet. Uh, the oxygen in the middle has three bonds to it to make an octet, two more electrons. Um, but because it has a third bond beyond its valence, it has a, a plus formal charge. Okay. We can't add any other bonds. Uh, the other bond, uh, other oxygen, would have three lone pairs. And that's all the electrons available from, from the atomic structures of oxygen to put together. That oxygen has one less bond than its valency, but still has the octet. So it has a formal minus charge. Overall, ozone is neutral. But there's one negative charge and one plus charge within the molecule. But that doesn't represent other structures. I could easily do it by putting the double bond between the other two oxygens. And I could draw it like this. Okay. Which of those is correct? Neither. What exists is something in between. Those are resonance forms for the two extremes. What actually exists in between is something else. So think about uh, uh, these, a lone pair of these coming down to form a new double bond, kicking those electrons up on there. That's how you would imagine going from there to there if it were really an equilibrium. In fact, the electrons are just delocalized throughout. So you have 
a half a minus charge on either end of this three oxygen unit. Similar kind of concept as the allyl carbocation, but now with uh, different atoms and different charges. Yes, question? I don't get how it's a negative charge. Uh, oxygen should have two bonds, so it starts with six valence electrons, and it somehow gains an additional one if you calculate the formal charge of that. So in general, I don't know how much uh, background in your general chemistry you have with formal charges, but, uh, but in calculating uh, what, what, how many bonds, like nitrogen with three bonds would be neutral, but if you had a fourth bond, it's plus charge, things like that. Look up formal charges and you can figure that out. So, generally, I again reiterate some of these points. When, we, when we're trying to represent structures where the Lewis structures don't do it adequately, we have to provide uh, the ends of the extremes that represent some combination of them. So the individual resonance forms don't really exist. Something in between those representations exists. Uh, resonance forms, when we're really looking at what is a resonance form of a molecule, the, the ends or the different resonance forms, we're only changing the distribution of electrons in pi or non-bonding electrons when we look at one specific Lewis structure or the other. If you're actually changing other bonds or changing hybridizations, but we're not talking about resonance forms there. We're talking about actually different molecules. Uh, you can't draw a Lewis structure that, that uh, does not obey normal valency rules. So you can't put 10 electrons around an atom, for example, in the combination of bonds and mole pairs. Uh, so that's a violation of the octet rule. Um, and of the various representations we have, actually what's, what's the actual structure in between is more stable than each of the individual resonance forms themselves. And they're not all symmetric, so not all resonance forms provide equal contribution to the structure. It's, um, it's a continuum. So if you have two molecules that are, then you have two rep resonance form uh, representations for the extremes of those, one could be higher in energy than the other, so the actual structure is probably closer in, in, in shape to what the more stable resonance form looks like, so somewhere in between. Okay, it depends on how, what the difference in stability is. You might have seen that if you were a student and noticed the difference between this allyl carbocation and this allyl carbocation. Notice the allyl carbocation that is symmetric. Both of the resonance forms are equal in energy. The actual structure is halfway in between. If we now make that structure unequal, notice the plus charge is not equal. This, in this representation, this plus charge is more substituted than that one. Which do you think is lower in energy of those representations? The one more substituted, right? This is lower in energy than the structure on the left. So the hybrid is not exactly in between. The actual structure is not exactly the, the middle of the combination of these. It lies more on this side, more towards the more stable one. And you can see that because there's more blue on the, on the one representing this structure, more blue, more positive on that carbon than that carbon. I don't know exactly what the difference is. Uh, but more positive here than there because it's being stabilized more on that side. So resonance forms can have different stabilities and the structure that actually represents is something in between. Uh, we're going to stop there. Please uh, take a look at resonance forms. I'm going to talk some more about resonance on Thursday and uh, we'll look at that in more detail in some more examples.